Good morning. This is Kay Edward Copeland. I'm pastor of New Zion Baptist Church, and I want to welcome you to our online experience. I'm excited because today we're starting a brand new series as I preach through the book of Colossians. So I'm going to invite you to get your Bible or whatever apparatus you use to access the scriptures and turn to Colossians chapter one. Today we'll be looking at verses one through 14. Just a side note, the reason that we preach through a book of the Bible. That is, we preach expositionally. We try to show you how a book fits together because each one of these books that were written were not written necessarily to be diced up or for us to just take scriptures out of context. We wanna show you how it all fits together, how a book fits together and why that book is actually in the Bible. So today we're gonna to focus on this letter that Paul, the apostle, wrote to the church at Colossae called Colossians. We're going to read verses 1 through 14 today, and the title of our entire series is called Nobody Like Jesus. Today, hear what Paul says in these first 14 verses. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven in which you previously heard the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even, even as it has been doing so in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you heard it from Epaphras, our, fellow, our beloved fellow bond servant, who was a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience Joy, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow, that's a lot. It's a power-packed prayer from a prisoner of the Lord, and today we want to talk about prayer priorities. I'm focusing today on um, the priorities that this prisoner, Paul, had when he prayed. And I'm titling it Prayer Priorities. You know that we live in an age where deep fakes are actually trying to hack our reality. Do you know what a deep fake is? A deep fake is synthetic media, usually videos, uh, that are created with the technology that we have available to us. And these videos, by manipulating images and voices of real people, can portray someone doing something they never did or saying something they never said. It's very uh, potent because these deep fakes are being used to bully people. And more importantly, in this uh, political season, we can anticipate 
more deep fakes, more manipulated images and videos as people try to promote their agendas and try to actually sway and persuade people to their polit po political ideology. Uh, now, the reason I bring it up is because as dangerous as that is, there has always been deep fake portrayals of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people have opinions about Jesus Christ, the church, and even Christianity, but very few have ever taken the time to invest, investigate what Jesus actually said, what the church actually does, and what Christianity actually is. And so through our study, uh, particularly even today, we want to see what the real thing is so we can recognize uh, what the fake thing is. And by God's grace, as Paul lays out his prayer priorities, he gives us some keen insight into the very nature of Christianity as well as the nature of our Christian walk. And he gives us some priorities as it relates to how we ought to pray for one another. This idea of, of, of knowing the real uh, was really inculcated in me by an experience I had with a friend of mine. I have a friend that lives in Hawaii. My wife and I decided to go out and visit uh, one year. And when we first got there, my friend said to me, he said, Ed, uh, do you like papaya? I said, well, I, I, I'm really not sure. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I really don't crave papaya. I don't really, uh, though I like fruit, I don't really particularly care for papaya. She said, I have a sneaking f uh, suspicion you've never actually tasted a real papaya. She, uh, out of her own yard, got an organic papaya next day and cut it up for me. And when I tasted it, I recognized that what I had been calling papaya, even though it had been packaged as such, really wasn't the real deal. It wasn't the organic papaya. And today I want to challenge you that as we grow in Christ, our flavor ought to reflect the real flavor of our Christ. Look at this text. Paul starts out by pointing out that he's with Timothy. Again, he's writing this letter to the Christians in this city called Colossae. It was near two other cities that Paul was concerned about, Heropolis as well as Laodicea. It was about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Paul had never met the individuals at this church, but he had heard of them through this man named Epaphras. We see Epaphras' name uh, mentioned here in verse 7. You'll also find his name mentioned in chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras had been discipled by Paul in Ephesus. He had went home and started evangelizing the people in his hometown. And now Paul is in prison writing a letter to the Christians in Colossae because Epaphras, the man he discipled, has come to Paul in his imprisonment and told them, told him about some of the things that the church in Colossae is experiencing. So Paul, along with Timothy, write them a letter to encourage them to really seek out the authentic and don't get caught up in all of the pressures to latch on to syncretic uh, syncretism in religion, uh, to go back into the religious traditions of Judaism or to try to uh, to fall uh, susceptible to the uh, milieu of the day, that is the environment that they were in and the Gnosticism that plagued that environment. So Paul, in this text, if you'll look at it just briefly, in verses three through eight, he gives thanks to God for some things. And then in verses nine through 14, he prays to God for some things. Let's take a look at it in verses three through eight. First of all, he says, we give thanks to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're praying for you always because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the love you have for all the saints, the hope that you have laid up in heaven because you heard the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as it has in all the world and is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. I just want to focus on a, a few things here. And that is this, as he is giving thanks for 
the saints in Colossae that he has not met yet, he gives thanks to them because, thanks for them, pardon me, because they have embraced the gospel and this gospel, according to Paul, is bearing fruit and increasing in them as it is in all the rest of the world. So he says something about the nature of the gospel here that we cannot afford to blow by, and that is this, that first and foremost, the gospel by its very nature, the word gospel means good news. This good news has to be heard, understood, and applied. And when it is heard, understood, and applied, this text tells us that it will be conspicuous and contagious. The, the way, way I get that is verse six. They, after having heard the, the word of truth, the gospel, it says that this gospel in verse six is constantly bearing fruit and increasing as it's been doing so in you from the day you heard it and understood. So notice he says uh, at least twice here that they have to, you have to first of all hear the gospel. Once you hear it, you have to understand it and then you have to apply it. And if you do so, you'll bear fruit. That's conspicuous. And it will continue to spread, bear fruit and increase It'll be conspicuous and contagious. The nature of the gospel is that it's vital and it's viral. It's organic and it's evergreen. It is something that when you catch it, you become contagious and other people catch it as well. This gospel that we preach. So now the reason I point that out is because I have a few questions for you today. Number one, are you growing as a Christian, because if you're grow, if you're not growing, that is, if you're not bearing fruit, if you're not uh, exhibiting some measure of uh, growth in Christian maturity, in love, that's what uh, Paul points out, that he's heard about the love that they have for all the saints and how they're continually growing in this love. If you're not growing that way, the question is, have you ever heard the gospel? Because if you've heard the gospel and you've understood it, then there ought to be some fruit. We ought to see some signs. See, Christianity is not just a box you can check off in a survey. It's an actual vital lifestyle where you are connected with the Lord of life. And if you are, it ought to be conspicuous. Are you growing? But not only that, are you contagious? That is to say, has anybody around you caught your Christianity? How is it that you have claimed to be a Christian and you claim to have been part of the body for some measure of time, but nobody has caught anything from you? The nature, the very nature of the gospel is that it's conspicuous as well as contagious. It, the, the, the gospel by its very nature, causes growth and it becomes viral. Paul is thanking God for these Christians at Colossae because he's heard of their love and the fact that they're growing, increasing. The gospel is growing and increasing, bearing fruit in them just like it does all over the, the rest of the world. And he points out that this beloved uh, friend that they share, Epaphras, has is who they learned it from and Epaphras caught it from Paul. And so as Epaphras gives a report to Paul about what's happening in the uh, city of Colossae and the Christians there, he points out that they are filled with love. Look at verse eight. He has also informed us of your love in the spirit. Now, let me just say something and then I got to get to this next point, And that is this. Don't tell me you're growing if you're not growing in love because the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, faith, meekness, all the rest of that. But the first fruit of the spirit is love. And if you're not growing in love, let me preach the gospel to you for God so loved the world. 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, wait a minute, but have everlasting life. And that life is vital, it's organic, it's evergreen, but it's viral as well. It's contagious. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more, what? Abundantly. That means more than enough so that others can catch it and can grow like you're growing. Paul, in his prayer of thanksgiving, gives us a little insight into the very nature of the gospel, that it's conspicuous and it's contagious. But not only that, look at how he prays. And this is the heart of the passage for our emphasis today. In verses 9 through 14, he says, For this reason also, since we have heard of it, that is, your growth in the gospel, your love in the spirit, the fact that the gospel, you have embraced it, and that just like every place else, it's planted, it's it's uh, expressing itself in bearing fruit in your lives. He says, since we've heard of that, we haven't ceased to pray for you and to ask God for some things. See, so in this first part, three through eight, he thanks God for some things. But here in verses nine through the rest of it, he's going to ask God for some things. What is he asking for? We have not ceased to pray for you pray for you and to ask, here it is, verse nine, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What a priority in prayer that for the people that he loves, he's praying first and foremost, here it is, that they would be completely clear on uh, God's will for their life and how that will ought to be expressed in their daily walk. Look at how he says this. I want you to be filled, to be completely clear, filled with the knowledge, the experiential knowledge of what God wants you to do in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What's the difference between wisdom and understanding? Within this context, wisdom has to do with this idea of understanding how the world works, understanding the principles of God and how they operate in general. Wisdom is knowing that if you sow, you will reap because that's how God made this world, that he's instilled certain principles in the world and a wise person knows how the world works. But not just wisdom, you have to have understanding. The, the word that is used for understanding in this text is a word that means that you know how to put it all together. See, it's one thing to know general principles. It's another thing to know how they apply to, spe to specific situations. So Paul prays as his priority that they would be filled with the knowledge, the experiential knowledge of God's will for their life with all wisdom in terms of how God created this universe to operate, but with understanding so they'll know specifically how to navigate in their context and with in certain circumstances. The Bible says it a different way back in Proverbs. Uh, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all you're getting, make sure you get what? An understanding. Paul's priority is, I want you to be completely clear on how you ought to navigate in this world. As you have gleaned spiritual principles from the book and as the Holy Spirit gives you insight on how you apply them, these principles to certain circumstances and aspects of your life. But not only that, he doesn't just want them to be completely clear. He wants them to be completely clear so that they'll be able to walk worthy. Do you see this in verse 10? Follow along with me. I want you to have all, uh, be filled with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the, the Lord. So he, he wants us to be completely clear so we can walk worthy. This word worthy is axios in the Greek. It literally means that there ought to be some balance if, in your life. There ought to be, uh, in light of how good God has been, your walk ought to reflect that. In other words, if God has been rich towards you in his grace and mercy, you ought not be walking raggedy in your daily walk, when we say walk, we're talking about how we navigate our daily experiences, our lifestyle, our behavior. If he's been rich, you ought to, you shouldn't be living raggedy. If he's been gracious, you shouldn't be greedy and stingy. If he's been merciful, you shouldn't be messy. Do you understand? We're talking about walking worthy, walking 
in light of, in light of how good he's been, there ought to be something reflected in that, in the walk that we have that shows that we're walking in line or we're behaving in line with how he's behaved with us. He says, I, I want you to be completely clear so that you can walk worthy. Look at what else he says in verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him. So completely clear so that you can walk worthy to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Why do we need to walk worthy? Because he, Paul says, I want you to be fully pleasing to him. That this gets you this idea of accountability, that our walk, that our behavior, that our manner of life, we need to be completely clear on what God expects of us, walking in wisdom and understanding, so that uh, in order that we can walk in a manner worthy, that is in, uh, in line with and commensurate with the blessings that we have received, our, bless, our behavior ought to reflect that so that we can please the one who has called us into right relationship with him. We want to please him. So literally he's saying, ultimately we have an accountability to God and we're living for an audience of one. He's the one that we want to please. He's the one that we want to smile when he looks at our life. But notice what else he says. I still got some in here. He says, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So listen to what he's saying here. I want you to not only be productive as it relates to bearing fruit. This is what we've been talking about before, that the gospel, once it grabs your heart, it ought to be conspicuous. That is to say, there ought to be some fruit at some point in your life. And part of the fruit is not just character, but according to verse 10, it's in every good work. And that work ought to be coupled with an increasing experiential knowledge of God. So he wants us to be not only completely clear to walk worthy, but he wants us to be perennially productive. That is evergreen. That is that we're bearing fruit in every good work. And we're also increasing in intimacy. Now, let's see how that works out. Working as well as intimacy. He, he's saying that we ought to bear fruit in every good work. And the idea here is that you weren't saved just so you can sit up and look saved and sanctified. But he's created you. Here's how the Bible says it. Paul says it differently in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He saved you so you could get busy bearing fruit, not just in your character, but bearing fruit in actual work, actual, uh, actual service to others around you. See, part of the problem with contemporary Christians, sometimes we think that our maturity in Christ is based upon what we don't do. So I'm, I'm a good Christian. I don't. Uh, I don't do this. I don't do that. We we have a sort of list of sins that uh, we chastise other people for because we don't like to do them. We say, well, I don't do that. I don't like to do this. I don't do that. That's the problem. You don't do nothing. This text says you were created to get to work and you ought to be perennially productive. That is not just exhibiting Christian character, but actually doing good work. Now, here's how Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your what? Good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. But it's not just about work. That is an outward flow, how, how we serve and minister to other people. But it's also about increasing in intimacy. That's what he says at the end of verse two, verse 10, pardon me, increasing in the knowledge of God. That word there, knowledge, is epigenoso. It's experiential knowledge. It's real knowledge. See, there's a difference between being exposed to the Christian jargon and Christian ease and Christian uh, culture and actually embracing the person of Jesus Christ, actually increasing in intimacy with him. Now, one of the ways we increase in intimacy with him is as we serve others, we find that Jesus meets us there because 
He is the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And sometimes you grow in grace and you grow even in your experiential knowledge of Christ as you serve others. But you also have to couple that increasing in the knowledge is what I'm talking about right now. How do I increase in intimacy? Well, how do you increase in intimacy with any other relationship? You got to spend time with the person. As you spend time in his word, learning his ways and hearing him speak to you in the voice of the Holy Spirit about how much he loves you, you grow in intimacy because the more you spend time with someone, the more you pick up on them, the more pick up on their uh, habits and their mannerisms and uh, you pick up on their voice. I can hear my wife's voice in a crowd why? Because we've been together 31 years. I know what to order when she we go someplace. She knows what to order me when we go someplace. Why? Because as we have increased in intimacy, now we are in lockstep with one another. And this text says that Paul's priority in prayer is that we would be perennially productive as relates to good works, but that productivity it's not just about work. It's about growing in intimacy with the one that we love. Let me see if I can't push on through here because I'm almost done. Look at what else he prays. He prays that they would be thoroughly powered up. Look at this in verse 11. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. He literally uses almost all the words you can use in the Greek for power. He, he, he's saying that his priority in prayer for these Christians in Colossae, and by extension, Christians throughout the ages, is that we would be thoroughly powered up, that we would be filled with all uh, the ability that God has, the strength that He got, God has for us in the living of this life. You, you understand the, the concept, because you know what it feels like when your phone or your Pad, your tablet is on the red line. That is to say, you only have two, three percent left. You know that you need to hurry up and get to a power source. Otherwise, you're going to miss your calls. You're going to lose data, all that type of thing. And Paul's prayer for us is that we will be consistently powered up, strengthened with the might that God provides from the inside out so that we can for what purpose? Look at verse 11. For the purpose of, look at this, for steadfastness is what the uh, New American Standard Bible says, steadfastness and patience. This idea of, it's very interesting, two Greek words that are used here, hupomeno and macrothumia. That hupomeno means that, Paul, here's his priority. I, I want you to be completely powered up so that you can have endurance, steadfastness. It's a word that literally means, hupo meno, uh, meno means to stay, to abide. Hupo means under. That it, The concept is that we need power to be able to stay up under whatever the pressures are of life. Notice Paul's priority is not that we would get out of trouble, but that we would learn and that we would be strengthened so that we'll be able to stay up under what God has allowed to come our way. Hupomeno, it means that you have the ability to persevere in the midst of trying circumstances. That's a greater strength than to be able to just jettison out of problems. The, 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 the ability, the strength to be able to bear up under the weight of a marriage that is not what you intended, of a job situation that is not what you had hoped for, of a sickness in your body that you did not anticipate. Uh, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that this gospel has the ability to help us to bear up under the weight. Why? Because we're not bearing that weight by ourselves. God gives us the strength, the power on the inside. And let me just point out something. The reason that you need power to be able to stay up under is because there are some muscles that God is activating as you stay up under the pressure that cannot be activated any other way except by pressure. Those of you who work out understand that principle, that it's, it's, it's a pressure over time. It's putting the, the muscle 
under pressure over time that helps the muscle to grow and to be strong. And God wants us to be fully capable for all that happens to us. That's why he says through the Apostle James in James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith works, worketh what? Patience. And let patience have its perfect work. Stay up under it until you are fully formed like God wants you to be. But not just perseverance and circumstances. This text also at the end of verse 11, where it says patience, that word is macrothumia. It literally means to have a long fuse. That has to do with how you deal with people. Paul's Prayer, priority in prayer is not that we would learn how to handle circumstances, but that we'll have to that we'll learn how to deal with people who get on your last nerves. Don't look at them right now. I'm just pointing out that something my father uh, used to say. He said, "Son, you got to learn how to live with people because you're going to be living with people the rest of your life." And Paul's priority for us is not just that we would be able to tolerate, but that we would learn through the grace of God, how to have a long fuse. Why? Guess what? God has had a long fuse with you. Here's how God describes himself in Exodus chapter 34, around verse six and seven. He says, I'm the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, slow to get angry, <laughs> plenteous in loving kindness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. See, if you're gonna walk worthy, you, you, you gotta let that fuse get a little bit longer. You got to let God work in you as you increase in intimacy with him to not only handle the circumstances of life, but handle the people in the life. Let me close this piece when we look at this. Now, this is very interesting. Paul is made in his prayer priorities. He's made a Thanksgiving sandwich. Notice how he starts out with Thanksgiving. We thank God for this, that, and the other. Blah, blah, blah. By the time we get down to verse 12, he says, here's my priority for you that you will learn how to give thanks to God. That that of all the things he could pray for, notice that he's prayed that they will be prudent, completely clear in what God expects and how to navigate life. He prays that they will be pleasing to God. He prays that they will be productive. He prays that they will be powered up. He prays that they would be patient. But then he doesn't close that thing out. He says, listen, here's my prayer for you that you would learn, that you would live a lifestyle of thanksgiving, that you would give thanks to God. What for, Paul? Gives us four things. I'm done. He says, you ought to be prayerfully thankful. You ought to be joyously grateful. Why? Because God the Father has qualified us. You see that in your Bible? I'm looking at verse 12. He has qualified us. He's made us fit. He's made us suitable to be able to inherit with all of the rest of the saints in light. Uh, that's verse 12. He's, he's qualified us. Isn't it good to know? And isn't it something that you can always thank God for? That he didn't love us because we were qualified. He qualified us because he loves us. And because we're qualified, we're loved by God. He's made us fit. He's made us suitable. He's made us adequate. Then that means, practically speaking, that wherever you go, you ought to walk not in arrogance, but you ought to walk in covenant <laughs> that, hey, I'm qualified, not because of my resume, because if you look at my resume, I ain't qualified, not because of my credit score, because if you look at the credit score, I might not be qualified, not because of my pedigree, because if you look at my background, I might not be qualified. I'm qualified because he made me qualified. He qualified us <laughs> to be able to receive an inheritance with all the rest of the saints. But not only that, he didn't just qualify us. According to verse 13, look in your Bible. He rescued us. He snatched us out of danger. He rescued us from the authority of darkness. Through the person and work of Jesus Christ, God the Father has delivered us. He snatched us away from the slaveholder that had us bound. He rescued us from impending danger. And he has taken us out of the domain, the authority of darkness and the end results that that darkness were, uh, produces. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness. But here it is. This is what I love about it. He didn't just get us out, but he got us out so he could get us too. Look at your Bible. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Why? So that he could transfer us to the kingdom of his beloved son. See, it, this is Exodus talk. He didn't just get them out of slavery. He got them to the promised land. 
Uh, forgive me for raising my voice, but I get excited when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. And in particular, the fact that it, he didn't leave me in darkness, but he got me out so that he could get me to. But then <laughs> look at this lastly. Uh, verse 14. I got to quit. In verse 14, he has redeemed us and forgiven us. Those two go together. This idea of redemption of paying the price to get a slave out of slavery, of paying the fine to get a prisoner out of prison, to paying off the debt to get someone who had an obligation to be debt free. He's forgiven us of our sins. He's redeemed us. This this idea, how did he redeem us? How did he rescue us? How did he transfer us? It's through his beloved son and the price that he paid on Calvary. It was through his work that he didn't just, it's, it's not just that uh, some angry God was somehow or another looking to punish his creation and somehow or another Jesus stepped in. It's that God himself, because if you're paying attention, this text says, give thanks to the father because he is the one who did it. It was God in Christ reconciling the world to us, qualifying us for an inheritance as his child, rescuing us from the domain of darkness, transferring us into the kingdom of his beloved son and redeeming us and forgiving us. I've told the story several times before. Let me tell it one more time. I'm, I'm done. But I'll point out that when I was in law school uh, in UC, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, I was perennially in trouble because I could never find a parking space, had to get to class. I'd just park and get tickets. Back in those days in that city, uh, after you got so many tickets, they would come and just take your car away. That is, they would tow your car until you paid the fines. I'd had that happen at least twice. And my last semester, as I was uh, trying to matriculate, I started uh, uh, amassing tickets uh, they, back in those days, this is a long time ago, they were $15 a pop. I didn't have the money. So I just held on to the tickets one day, hoping that I would have money to pay for them. I went ahead and graduated without them putting a boot on my car, without them towing the car away. I thought I got away scot-free. But then when I came to Illinois, that is, I moved from California back to Illinois uh, and was preparing to take the bar exam, I did not know until it was time to take the exam and I was filling out the application to even take the bar exam. You have to detail, you have to list every, if you've ever been arrested or anything like that, but every parking fine, every parking violation that you've ever had and you have to give proof that the ticket, the fine has been paid. Every ticket you've ever had in your life, you got to detail it and show proof that you had Paid it. I'm in trouble now because I know I got all these tickets and I have not paid them. I called the clerk, the traffic clerk in Berkeley, California from Kankakee, Illinois, where I was living. I called and said, listen, uh, my name is Edward Copeland. I have some tickets that I need to pay. I just need to know what the fine is I, because Back in those days, if you didn't pay the ticket within like 24 hours, 36 hours or some time, then the amount, the fine went up. And I needed to know how much the tickets were. Called the lady. She said, well, now what's your name again? I said, Kenneth Edward Copeland. She looked, said, well, we don't have any record of you. I said, well, no, I, I used to live in the area. I have moved, but... Uh, I know I got the tickets. I have them in my hand. I, I, I can give you the numbers of the tickets. She said, let me look one more time. She looked. She said, sir, you, we don't have any record of you. I said, well, I know. She said, wait a minute. She said, now, where did you say you calling from? I said, I'm calling from Illinois. She said, tell me this. I said, when you left California, did you give up your old ID? And did you get a new identification when you went to Illinois? I said, yes, I did. I had in order to get my Illinois ID, I had to give up my California ID. She said, sir, that's what happened. She said, when you transferred, wait a minute, when you left here and went there, you 
from our perspective, got a new ID and all of your fines, all your violations have been cleared out of your record. When you moved, you got a clean slate. Ain't nobody listening to me today. But the truth of the matter is you can always give thanks to God if you're in Christ, because even though you did it and you owed it, your record is clear because he qualified us by rescuing us and transferring us from the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now because of who Jesus is and what he's done, your record is clean. You have a clean slate. And you always have something to be thankful to God for. So here's my question. Are you grateful? Are you thankful? And are you bearing fruit? Paul's prayer priority was that we would know, be completely clear about what God wants us to do, that we would walk worthy of that same calling, that we would be perennial, perennially productive, that we would bear fruit and increase in our intimacy with God, not just being exposed to the Christian life, but embracing it. <laughs> and that when it's all said and done, that we would learn patience with circumstances as well as with people. While we're doing that, we can be thankful to God that he was so patient with us and that he has been so gracious and so merciful to us and that he's forgiven us of all our sins. Now, if you don't know him in a personal way, listen, don't get caught trying to pay your own tickets. Listen, don't get caught trying to pay the penalty for your own sin. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But God demonstrated his love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you'll put your faith, put your trust in him and allow him to transfer you, to rescue you from where you are, bring you to where he wants you to be, you can give thanks with all the rest of the saints that he's qualified us to share in his inheritance. I hope all this makes sense. We're going to continue to preach through the book of Colossians. We'll pick up in verse 15 next week. But in the meantime, I trust that that Paul's prayer priorities will be actualized in your life and my life, and that as we pray for one another, that we pray along the lines of Scripture, that the ones we love will be completely clear, completely pleasing, completely productive, and completely thankful for what God has done in Christ. God bless you, and have a great day.